we're going to um, shift gear a bit here now and focus on more the practicalities of how do we assess and address spirituality in counseling. Um, a little bit of a darker uh, tone to this talk because we're going to be addressing not only how we access spirituality as a resource for our clients, but also what happens when spirituality is part of the problem that people are bringing into counseling. Just a couple of words about spiritually integrated therapy, first of all, at least the way I think about it. Um, first of all, spiritually integrated therapy rests on an assumption I'm sure you share, which is we're not only psychological, social, and physical beings, we're spiritual beings. And that applies to everyone. Um, it's, it's not as if some of us are physical beings and others of us aren't. Some of us are <clears throat> social beings, others aren't. It's the same for spirituality. We all, at some level, I think, are spiritual beings too. What makes spirituality, I think, sometimes challenging to address in the context of our clinical work is not that it's separated from the rest of our lives, but that it's interwoven in the rest of our lives. And yet, if we don't know how to look deeply, see deeply, remember the figure ground? If we can't see deeply, then we may not find it in our clients because it may not be the figure that they bring to us. We may have to look more deeply for the deeper dimension to the issues that they're dealing with. But spiritually integrated therapy then refers to a dimension of life that's integrated in the rest of our lives. And in that sense, it's relevant to everyone. Spiritually integrated therapy, I'm making a bold claim, it's relevant to everyone. It's not just to people who may be um, devout, committed, identified with a particular religious tradition, spiritually integrated approaches to life, I think, are relevant to virtually anyone. The approach that I've taken in, with spiritually integrated therapy is not specific to any tradition, but as we've talked about this morning, I've tried to, to think about this in a way that could be applicable to people across various religious um, commitments. That's not to say that we can't um, develop more differentiated and refined approaches that are specific to particular traditions. But the overarching idea of spiritually integrated therapy can apply, again, to virtually anyone. I also want to just state from the outset that spiritually integrated counseling, at least the way I'm looking at it, is not a competitor to any model of treatment. It's not a uh, new kid on the block. So we're not talking about it in the same sense that we might talk about being committed to psychodynamic therapy or being a cognitive behavioral therapist or being a rational emotive therapist or being a dialectical behavioral therapist. There is no three-letter acronym for spiritually integrated therapy other than the SIP, and I don't like that. <laughs> SIP just doesn't have much panache to me. Um, or SIT, spiritually integrated therapy, SIT. That doesn't sound any better. So the, the idea here then is that spiritually integrated therapy can be integrated and should be integrated in any model of treatment. So no matter what your primary, your favorite orientation may be, spiritually integrated therapy can and should be a part of it, whether you're psychodynamic, behavioral, cognitive behavioral, trauma-focused, trauma whatever your interest is, spiritually integrated therapy should be a part of that. So it's not a competitor. So with that background, what I'd like to do then is to, uh, first of all, tell you another story that got me really kind of hooked in this area clinically. Um, it's kind of like the, a darker story than that of Alice, but it's the story of uh, Jerry. And then we'll lead into this section on the practicalities of assessing and addressing spirituality and therapy. I saw Jerry many years ago, an African-American man who was in my office, my waiting room, and he looked like he was about 75, maybe 80. I later learned that he was 60 years old, 
but he's sitting in the waiting room, head sunken down, and mumbling to himself, my brother Joe is dead. My brother Joe is dead. There's some other people in the waiting room looking at him like, what's going on with this guy? He's just sitting, my brother Joe is dead. So I go out to meet him, and this is what I'm hearing. And I ask him to come back with me to the room, and he doesn't move. He just says, my brother Joe is dead. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's catatonic, or he's dissociating, or I don't know what the story is, some state of shock. And I went up to him, and I introduced myself, and I said, well, why don't you come back to my office, Jerry, and we can talk about your brother Joe. So he gets up and follows me, um, sits down in my office, and for the first few minutes just keeps repeating, my brother Joe is dead. And the, the image I had is of someone who has something caught in their throat. They can't spit it out, but they can't swallow it. It's just stuck that my brother Joe is dead. But after a few minutes, he began to talk. You know, so I asked him to tell me about his brother Joe, and he said um, his brother Joe was a deacon uh, along with him in the AME church, and um, he had cancer. And he had nursed his brother for the last three or four years through a very traumatic, painful death. And he had always been close with his brother. They had worked a lot in the church together. But as I explored more, I learned that in the last five years, he had lost both of his adult sons um, to illness. Both of his parents had died. Um, on, his, on, the funeral, on the funeral procession on the way to the burial of his brother Joe, his sister had had a stroke and was paralyzed in half of her body. His wife was suicidal. And I was learning this within the first 20 minutes. Um, we, we talked more, and um, I, my, my thinking to myself initially was, boy, this, this man sounds like Job, the biblical Job, what he's been through, just losing everything. And, and this wasn't the full story. He also told me later in the session he'd been uh, served in combat in Vietnam and he recounted the story of being on a combat patrol and they were uh, coming back and taking a, a break. They drew straws to see who would get water for his unit. He lost, so he had to go get the water. And when he was getting the water, his unit was mortared and everyone was killed. He was the only survivor. And again, I'm thinking, Job. And at one point, I even said to him, you know, this sounds like the story of Job, knowing that he's a deacon in the AME church. And he kind of just laughed ruefully, saying, uh, you know, well, I wish, um, you know, I had a life like Job, but I don't expect God to come back at me with any rewards. He said, all I've gotten from God is trouble. He said, I just wish God would leave me alone. I asked him later, I said, Jerry, you know, you've been through so much. What, what's, the, what's the part of this that's most difficult for you? And he said, why? Why? I can't understand why God is doing this to me. My sons were good, good men. We, you know, we grew up in a really, they grew up in a very rough area, a lot of crime, a lot of violence, but they never got into that. Other kids on the street grew up, became drug dealers, involved in crime, and I see them walking on the street. Why are they walking on the street? And my sons, both good boys, are dead. I asked him whether he got any support from his church. And again, he laughed. He said, I spoke to my pastor, and my pastor said to me, surely you must have done something to step out of God's good graces. And he said angrily, and he calls himself a man of God. Clearly, uh, Jerry was dealing with a lot of psychological symptomatology and problems. He presented with full-blown PTSD, um, dealing with a deep depression, and that deserved a lot of attention. But of all the things that Jerry was facing, what he was recounting is the most difficult part 
of his problem was spiritual. He had questions of ultimate meaning. Why? He had struggles with God. Why is God doing this to me? Why is God punishing me? He couldn't put it together. He was, in the words of um, Paul Tillich, he was shaken to his foundations. And he had no place to kind of put it or put it together. I realized that with time that the better biblical metaphor for Jerry was not Job, it was Jacob. Because Jacob was wrestling with the angel, and so was Jerry. Jerry was wrestling with God. I learned that the, the most helpful thing I could do with Jerry was not engage in any kind of theological discussion, not to offer any kind of redemptive theology. I, when I tried to talk with him about anything like that, he would just get mad as a hornet and basically shut me down. And on top of that, he was a lot more knowledgeable than I was. I mean, this was a very bright, theologically learned man. The most helpful thing I could do for Jerry was to um, be present. Basically, zip my lip, stop myself from talking, and just listen to him, and let him know that I was with him in his suffering, and listen to him lament. He was lamenting, and he needed some presence to kind of witness his lament without criticizing, without trying to replace it with a more hopeful narrative. He needed someone who could acknowledge and hear his lament and leave it at that. I was really struck by that, that this is a dimension of counseling that I had never been exposed to. No one had taught me this. Um, and, and I found over the years that few people, at least in psychology and in the mental health professions, are taught how to work with someone who is presenting with spiritual struggles. How do we respond? What do we, as counselors, have to offer? It's clear to me the kinds of things that would be unhelpful to Jerry. One would be um, offering nothing, ignoring it, changing the subject, the other would be trying to somehow offer kind of like a false positivity, a false hope. And so what do we do with people like Jerry? Because he's not alone. Um, the material I didn't present from the last talk really focuses on how common spiritual struggles actually are and how linked they are to the problems people bring to therapy. That many people who come to therapy have struggles with their faith, with their spirituality that are really very deeply tied to their depression, their anxiety, their drug, their alcohol use, whatever the presenting psychological problems may be, there's a deeper spiritual dimension to it. And we've done a number of studies, it's been one of my main interests, showing that these spiritual struggles can be very predictive of declines in mental health and physical health, that spiritual struggles, in fact, predict greater risk of dying. They're that powerful. But why shouldn't they? If we're being shaken to our core, if we end up having tension and conflict with God, questions about evil or demonic forces, interpersonal spiritual struggles with our loved ones, with our congregation or church, struggles of ultimate meaning, struggles that are moral in nature, struggles that involve this inner wrestling or tension between our higher selves and our, the way we act, and failing to live up to our moral principles and our spiritual values. These are spiritual struggles, and they're quite predictive of distress and decline. How can we ignore them? I don't think we can. We need to find ways to integrate that concern into therapy. So what I'd like to talk about in this um, section will be, first of all, how do we assess spirituality in therapy? How do we draw on spirituality as a resource, help our clients access their spiritual resources? And then the third part, so what happens when spirituality is part of the problem? That's the trickiest one. How do we help people who are coming to us with struggles or spiritual problems or, or a form of religion or spirituality that's in fact harmful to them? How do we address that? Okay, so that's the overview.
Got it? Okay. Let's talk about assessment. The first step in assessment is kind of setting the stage for spiritual dialogue. Um, I'm always uh, kind of amazed that people are willing to come to see a stranger and open up and share their most intimate concerns. I mean, that takes so much guts. When I, when I teach my graduate students they, how they should be really respectful of the courage that our clients show in coming to see us and opening up, it really takes guts. And, and so I feel very honored by my clients to come in and see us and talk to us about these issues. But how do we foster that conversation? In some ways, I think about it, it is a meeting of two worlds. You know, there's the world of the client that we need to know and learn about, but there's also our world. So the relationship involves a meeting of two worlds, and how do we then set the stage for the talk that follows? Well, I think, first of all, it involves our communicating an openness to learning. It's kind of an attitude of humility. The best way to shut down conversation around spirituality is to act as if you know what your client is talking about. Act as if you know what your client is talking about. So if your client says, well, you know I'm born again, you go, oh yeah, no. You don't know what that means. The, the most appropriate question is, um, well, could you tell me more about that? What does that mean for you when you say you're born again? What was your experience like? What's that about for you? Or if someone says they're Presbyterian, they're Muslim, they're Jewish, or they're Catholic, do you know what that means? I would say you don't. Because we know there are so many meanings and interpretations of that. Here's a really radical idea. You may throw tomatoes at me. I don't think there's such a thing as the Protestant, the Jewish, the Muslim, or the Catholic client. I mean, we use that language to be, to facilitate easy conversation, but who is the Protestant client? I've never met him. I've never met the Catholic client because there's so many variations. So the challenge for us is to be invited into our client's world so they can tell us what their spiritual experience is all about. And we can't do that if we act as if we know. And there's been a lot written about the challenges of working with someone from a different religious tradition. So can you work with someone who's not from your tradition? Can an atheist work with someone who's religious? Well, I would actually suggest that there's another challenge. And that's the challenge of working with someone from your own tradition. And that's a whole different set of challenges. Because that's the one where it suggests to us we may fall victim to that notion that we really know that client just based on their religious identification. And I would again say, no, you don't. You don't. Because people come to us with all kinds of spiritual stories, and every story is unique. So we invite a dialogue by sharing our interest and openness to learn, by communicating our humility. I don't know much about that. Can you tell me more? What's that like for you? I don't know what that means for you. Could you say a little bit more? But I'd really like to learn. It's that kind of tell me more mentality when it comes to spirituality. The other side, and this gets a little trickier, is sharing an openness to reveal a little bit about ourselves. Now, we have to be careful here. You know, clients don't come to us to hear our stories. You know, it's comical to think that, well, okay, a client comes to you and they share their story and then you say, you think you had a bad day. But let me tell you about a bad day. <laughs> you wouldn't believe what happened to me on the way to work. <laughs> or are you having problems with your kids? Well, I've got some stories about kids that'll put your hair up on its ends. You know, I mean, I've thought that sometimes when I've had a bad day, but you don't go there because that's not what therapy is about. So, you know, we can go too far in sharing too much. It's not about 
Ultimately, the focus is the client, not us. On the other hand, the idea that we can be, as Freud would say, a blank slate, that we need to, need to completely set ourselves aside as people in therapy, I don't think it's possible. We, we share ourselves whether we like it or not. You know, Carl Rogers was famous for um, trying to be unconditionally positively regarding, no matter what. But studies of Carl Rogers showed, they did video studies of Carl Rogers and showed that he was actually quite selective in what he would nod to and what he would smile to. <laughs> he wasn't neutral. He was selective. And it's nothing bad about Carl Rogers. How can you avoid it? I'll tell you a funny story. I was working with this client who, she was coming in because she was just a, a really lovely person, really doing all kinds of um, socially valuable things in the community, helping people, just a heart of gold. But she grew up in a very critical family, and she had, in, in, she had really internalized that and could never do enough, always felt bad about herself self-critical, so she walked around with tremendous um, low self-esteem and depression and would just get really down on herself. And I, I tried all kinds of things to help her find a more realistic way of evaluating herself, but I was not successful. So one day she comes in and uh, she's telling me again how she's failed this way and how she's no good and her parents were right about her. And then she said to me, and I can see I'm failing you too, you're not you know, I'm letting you down. I said, well, what's giving you that impression? And she says, oh, you know that thing that you do. <laughs> I said, what am I doing? She says, well, you know, when you get frustrated with me, what you do? I say, what do I do? She says, you know, you put your hands on the back of your head and you go like. <sighs> <laughs> I mean, I had no idea what she was talking about. I mean, then I look at myself and there I am. I was clueless. <laughs> so it was actually a good moment because I, I said, you know what, you caught me. <laughs> I said, I have to tell you, I feel really bad. And I feel really bad, not about you, but I feel bad like I'm letting you down. I feel like I'm failing you. I think you're such a great person. And I've been trying to help you develop a more realistic sense of yourself. And I'm just getting stuck. And so I'm getting frustrated. But it's not with you. It's with me that I'm letting you down which led to this great conversation about how we both have these high expectations for ourselves. And yeah, I did some personal sharing, but I thought it was appropriate in that context. But I didn't do it until she called me out. The idea that we can be totally neutral and detached, that's as extreme as turning the focus of therapy about all about us. So what's the appropriate level of personal sharing? I mean, that's, that's the challenge. Where do we find that space of being authentic human beings without the therapy turning into us, or with us then imposing our own lives and stories onto clients? We've got to be really careful with this. And I, I tend to prefer being um, more explicit about where we're coming from. I think there's some real value to that, even though I know there are therapists who don't agree, who say it's inappropriate. But I, again, I'm trying to find that point of balance in saying something about ourselves without it becoming all about ourselves or imposing on other people. So let me give you an example of that. I saw that she was 30 years old. She'd been referred to me from uh, her therapist who was um, a uh, Christian therapist, Mary was a Roman Catholic, and 30 years old, she had been dating for uh, all her life, really, I mean, all her adult life, and came to me because she was frustrated that she um, hadn't met the right guy yet. She had hoped to be married by this time in life with a big family. That was her dream, to be married with a lot of kids. <clears throat> so I asked her to describe what you know, what was going on. She said, well, you know, I started dating when I was 18 and, you know, I'd meet guys and 
never, she was, you know, no problem with her. She was a nice woman, attractive. She would meet guys without any problem. And um, then she would kind of quickly imagine herself uh, married with kids. So second date, she'd be imagining what the kids would look like. <laughs> so she meets a guy, falls in love very quickly, thinking marriage, and then she said, and then these guys, they go ahead and they do something stupid. She says, you know, like guys do. <laughs> like I'm some authority on guys doing stupid things. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, guys, stupid guys. <laughs> and I said, and what happens when they do something stupid? She said, well, I break things off, I get really angry, and I just go back to my room and basically recover for six months. And then I realized my clock is ticking, so I better meet somebody again. I said, so how often have you had this kind of cycle? She said, probably like 25 or 30 times. She's been doing it for, you know, 12 years. So she'd do it every few, you know, couple times a year. And she says, and now I'm 30, and the clock is really ticking. How am I going to have a big family? I can't meet a guy. I keep meeting these guys who are just really stupid. You know. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I'm getting to know her, and um, about six weeks into the therapy, she comes in and says, I just want you to know, I think you're the best therapist there is. I'm so happy to be working with you. I couldn't imagine a better therapist. I'm thinking, I'm in trouble. <laughs> So I went from this kind of assessment mode, figuring things out, to thinking, boy, I've got to move kind of quickly, or I'm going to be the latest in the series of guys who've been put on a pedestal and then fall off. I, I saw what was going on. And so I said to her, pretty quickly and pretty directly, I said, you know, it seems to me that uh, you see guys in terms of two, two categories. You have your saints and you have your sinners and um, you know you run into guys who you think are saints and then they become sinners pretty quick she said no I said no she says no I, th I think of them in terms of angels and demons <laughs> I said okay we can go with that <laughs> So you got your angels and you got your demons. And then I, I said, and I did some, here's some example of some disclosure sharing. I said, well, you know I'm Jewish. And from my point of view, um, I don't usually think about a lot of angels and demons around. Uh, I think from my perspective, you're missing a category. And she says, what? And I said, human beings. I said, you know, I think from my point of view, at least, most of us have a bit of the angel and a bit of the demon within us, at least some good and some bad within us. We each have that, those qualities. And so th the question is, how do, you, how do you form a relationship with people who have both some good and some bad in them, some the angel and some of the demon? And you know, she was just listening, and she said, huh, well, I hadn't thought about it quite like that. I love that, huh. When people go, huh, it's really great, because that means they're in this place where they're a little bit off balance and beginning to think about a new idea. They don't accept it right away. It's not like she says, oh, okay, fine, and everything's great. No, she goes, huh, I love that. So then I said, and then this is all in one session, moving really quick, because I know I'm about to get dumped. Um, <laughs> I said, it seems to me that you have a wonderful resource from your own Catholic tradition, and that could help you with human beings. And she said, what's that? I said, forgiveness. She goes, huh. <laughs> she said, I've never been very good at that. I said, OK, well, maybe that's something you could get better at, because I think it's going to hold the key for you being able to move forward. Would you be willing to talk about forgiveness? Well, that's what we did. And that was tremendously helpful. I gave her resources from her tradition, Catholic tradition, on forgiveness, which she read, and uh, some how-to kinds of books 
written from a Christian point of view of how do you forgive. We went over it together, and it was very enlightening. I mean, I've edited a book on, with some uh, Christian colleagues of mine on forgiveness, and I've learned a tremendous myself amount myself from it. So we talked about it, and you could see in the process he was just kind of really taking it in and lightening up and became less severe looking. And I don't often do this, but I said to her, this is just a couple months in, I said, you know what, Mary? I think you're going to meet a guy soon because she just, she's just radiating signals. You know? <laughs> I said, I think you're going to meet a guy soon. And I said, and you know what's going to happen? She said, no, what? I said, I think you're going to fall in love right away. And I said, and then you know what's going to happen? She said, he's going to do something really bonehead dumb, won't he? You know, they're guys. Huh? <laughs> and, um, but what are you going to do when the guy does something really stupid? And I think I even added, as we all can do. Um, and she said, work on forgiveness? I said, maybe so. What would you think about that? She said, okay. Well, the next week, I'm not a great predictor of anything. I don't hold myself out as that kind of person at all. But the next week, she came in and said, you won't believe this. I met a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he's really so cute. And I think I already love him. And I'm starting to think about what our kids are going to look like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, but you know what's going to happen. She says, yeah, he's going to do something stupid soon, isn't he? I said, yeah, he will. And so, but what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to try to do, work through the issue and see if I can maintain a relationship and see if there's room for forgiveness in this. I said, that all sounds great. And that's what she did. I mean, the guy did something. He made a mistake. And the kind of mistake she would have ended the relationship with, but this time she stuck, in it, stuck there with it and she talked to him and worked it through. And she actually brought him in at one point in the therapy when there was another sticky issue. And he was a perfectly reasonable guy, you know, just a guy, you know, just who makes mistakes. And, um, but she had developed the skill to be able to resolve issues and let some things go as well and forgive. And, you know, I, I, but I, I told her, I said, you know, this is just the first guy you've met with this kind of new, deeper spirituality. So don't be surprised if this relation doesn't work, but you're developing the skills now that you're gonna, it's gonna work. You should feel hopeful and optimistic. Said, okay, but she actually sustained the relationship with this guy and they got married. And uh, I get postcards every, every now and then and I think they're on their fourth baby. And it is a kind of happy story, but it involves sharing. Now, some might say, well, it wasn't appropriate for me to share as much as I shared. It was changing the subject, but I don't think so. I think it was okay to be direct and share and to be sensitive to her resources and values, but also to say something about mine uh, and to facilitate her goals, which was to, you know, have a family, meet somebody and have intimacy with someone. Okay, so once we, once we have set the stage for dialogue, then let's talk about some of the specifics of, more specific about it. I'd like to think about three different types of assessment in therapy. First is the initial spiritual assessment. This is, these are the questions that I think we weave into the uh, intake uh, interview. The and I say weave purposely because this initial assessment is not, spiritual assessment is not separated out from other dimensions of life. Remember, it's integrated. So it's not as if we're, you know, we're, let's talk about your physical health, let's talk about your mental health, let's talk about your spiritual, your social well-being. Now we're talking about spirituality. No, no, it's integrated and it should be seamless. Like life, I mean, these are all dimensions that are interwoven. So here's some initial assessment questions. Do you see yourself as a religious or spiritual person? What way? Are you affiliated with a denomination or community? Which one? Has your problem affected you religiously or spiritually? If so, how? That gets at spiritual struggles. 
Has your religion or spirituality been involved the way you've coped or dealt with your problem? So that speaks to spirituality as a resource. So in these questions, we're opening the door to a conversation and recognizing that spirituality can both be a help and a hindrance. And we're laying that out at the outset of therapy. Again, these questions should be kind of seamlessly interwoven. I like these questions. I, even though I've developed a number of quantitative measures, I don't use those in therapy. Because in therapy, I want my questions to open the door to conversation. And closed-ended questions, I think, tend to shut the door. Yes, no questions, they shut the door. Yes, are you spiritual? Yes or no? Well, no. Well, if you are, can you say a little bit more? In what way? We want this to open things up, not close things down. all of the viewers of Shalom TV throughout the world, I want to encourage you not only to support this amazing media apostolate, but to spread the word to others. We all know how the internet and mass media are polluting the world with the poison of pornography and so much other forms of materialism. This is the source of eternal life, the gospel, and Shalom TV is consecrated to spreading the word of Christ. Thank you. Shalom World, God's own channel.